I'm Professor Jordan Peterson. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist and a, a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. And um, I teach and uh, I have a clinical practice, although I'm on hiatus right now. Um, I do a lot of business consulting. I have a business online that helps people plan their futures and write about their past and analyze their personalities. And, and uh, for the last year or so, I've been embroiled in a philosophical and political controversy, a series of them, I suppose, in Canada, and more broadly as well. So the question is, why does public shaming work on the human mind? Well, it's a good thing that it works. You know, I mean, it takes a lot of different emotions to make people properly social. And some of those are positive emotions. We enjoy being around other people. So there's, that would be a straight positive emotion um, associated with approach and excitement and fun. We bond with other people, and that's a different emotional system, a number of them, mediated partly by opiates and partly by chemicals like, um, uh, now I won't be able to remember the name, It'll, oxytocin. Um, but then there's negative emotions too. So if you're a conscientious person, for example, you feel guilt if you're not contributing to the community. And if you're not sociopathic, you feel shame if you've, if you've acted in a manner that indicates that you're not a reliable member of the social organization. And you should feel that way. Now, of course, the problem with negative emotions, and positive emotions for that matter, is that they can be amplified beyond utility. That happens in all sorts of mental illnesses. Um, and they can be manipulated. And then, of course, with regards to our current state, which, which is something we've never encountered before, is that you can be the target of hundreds of thousands or even millions of people suddenly. And it's absolutely overwhelming. So most of these things are necessary, but you know, they can go badly astray and they can be manipulated. So, and we don't know what to do about that, especially with, with regards to social media, because nobody, uh, nobody knows anything about social media, really. It's too new. So. I don't know if the media, media per se has hijacked shame. I think that ideologues hijack shame regularly. You know, you saw this, for example, under the Maoists in particular, where they used public shaming constantly as an, an ideological tactic. And so, now to the degree that the media, let's say, whatever that is now, is complicit in pushing an ideological uh, narrative forward, you know, and maybe the postmodernists would argue that you're always pushing an ideological narrative forward, no matter what you're doing. They're participating in the harnessing of shame for, for specific political ends. And, well, if you believe, like the postmodernists do, that the world is nothing but a, a stage of competition between different groups who are competing fundamentally for power, then there's no way out of that. But I, I think that's an unbelievably dismal view of the world. I also think part of the reason that there's an alternative media growing, particularly on YouTube, is because there, there are ways of presenting information that aren't precisely ideologically motivated. Now, it's tricky because you have to have a framework through which you look at the world in order to understand the world. And it does tend to be a narrative framework because narratives tell you how to get from one point to the other. And human beings are always getting from one point to the other. I mean, we're alive, that's what we do. But, and so this is something Jean Piaget, a developmental psychologist, pointed out. In some ways, the truth is not so much a set of facts, although there are forms of truth like that, as a process. And the people who are popular on, on YouTube, Joe Rogan's a good example, is he brings people in and they have a discussion. And the truth is actually, in the process of the discussion. And, and the reason I think Rogan works so well is because he's actually trying to learn something when he's talking to his guests. He isn't driving forward his a priori notions. He has them, because everyone does, but he's looking to expand them and transform them during the conversation. And so 
the truth of the conversation isn't so much in the conclusions as in the dialectical process by which those conclusions are generated and people actually really like to listen to that so when I lecture for example because my lectures have become quite popular on on YouTube I'm not telling people what conclusions I have drawn although I can't help but do that to some degree I'm trying to extend my knowledge of the topic while I'm lecturing and so what that enables people to watch is the process by which by which new maps of the world, that's a good way of thinking about it, come into being and that's very exciting for people well that's what we do in a conversation like this, if it's a real conversation you know, we're trying to figure out what's going on rather than to state categorically this is what's going on and this is, these are the people behind it it's like, well no, we, we can toss out hypotheses, we can try to figure, out, figure it out and that's what makes the conversation engaging and interesting a lot of these new interviewers, let's say run very long shows, they're not sound bites, they're not clips, they haven't been run through the production mill and actually people on YouTube don't like that sort of thing, they like it, they like it raw there's lots of people on YouTube like Girl Says What, Karen Strawn, she just sits at her kitchen table and talks and there's a bit of editing, you know, to get rid of the ums and that sort of thing but you get the whole thing, you get to draw your own damn conclusions and I, I think that's, you were, we were talking a little bit about truth, it's like if you're a journalist, see this journalist came and did a story about me in a magazine called Toronto Life last year, eh? and he did a quite a bit of background research and the article was actually pretty well researched but he couldn't resist the temptation to tell his readers what to think you know, and so he had some opinions about me and they weren't particularly positive and so he'd lay out some of the background information that he had gathered and then he'd tell the readers what that meant and the piece came out and I wasn't very happy with it and so I wrote him and I said, you know, like kudos on your background research and why the hell didn't you just let the readers make up their own damn minds you don't have any trust in your journalistic ability, you don't have any trust in your audience so you wrote a, uh, you wrote a propaganda piece now you might say, well you can't help but introduce your biases and of course to some degree that's true but you can present, see, the world's too complex to describe completely and so you have to lay a structure on it in order to simplify it and you might say because of that there's no way of getting at the truth because you have to lay this structure on it and simplify it but that's actually not technically correct like imagine that because when you, when you simplify the world you're basically compressing it like a compression algorithm and if you use an unbiased compression algorithm to represent a set of data then you sample equally from the entire data set you don't take all the data, but you sample equally and then you get a representation of the whole it's an accurate representation, it's just not as detailed well that's sort of what you want to do as a journalist to the degree that you can you know, and, and partly you understand that you have biases so you talk to people who have different opinions or maybe you even figure out what the different opinions are and, and make them strong and address them while you're, while you're telling the story and to say that you can't do that is well I think that's, it's, it's deeply and insanely cynical because it also means, if you can't do that, it also means you can't communicate you know, if, if there's no truth, why do people talk to each other? what the hell's the point? There, there, we wouldn't communicate if there was no way of communicating truth it would be pointless the postmodernists tend not to ad admit in some sense to the existence of the objective world you know, and I think that's fundamentally a complexity issue is that there's a world that exists beyond our comprehension of it and so that's the simplification problem but the problem with the consensus theory of reality is that well, there, there are obstacles in the world that you bump into regardless of your damn consensus and so you can, you can argue that that's not the case, but it's futile I mean, because you learn in your own experience that there are elements of, of reality even within your subjective experience, that your interpretive structure can't lay a hand on you can't argue yourself out of being hungry, especially if you're really hungry you can't argue yourself, sometimes you can't argue yourself out of being in love even if you know it's the wrong person you can't, and fundamentally, you can't argue yourself out of pain 
you know, and that's the fun, that's why I think that the ultimate truth in some sense is that life is suffering. It's like, good luck laying down an ideological overlay on that. Like, you can adjust your pain to some degree through thought, you know. It, it is malleable to some degree, but not in the final analysis. And so, so arguing that, th that the world, that a separate world of constraints beyond your interpretive framework doesn't exist is, it, A, it's, it's futile, it's not going to work for you, and B, you never act that way. You know, people who talk about science as, say, a patriarchal Western construction, you know, they're making observations that the scientific method is, first of all, to some degree, a consequence of the subjective interest of the researcher, fair enough, and that researchers are subject to ambition, like everyone else, and hey, absolutely, but part of the scientific method is the competition of ambitions, and and the decision through the competing ambitions about what actually constitutes the shared ground of experience. And you might say, well, I don't believe in any of that. It's like, yes, you do. You use computers. You fly on airplanes. You drink filtered water. You participate in a technological society. And, and you, by participating in it, you indicate your assent to the ontological presuppositions and the epistemological presuppositions upon which it's based. And you might say, well, no, I don't. And I would say, well, who cares what you say? I'm going to watch how you act. And as, as a better indicator of, of your fundamental truth. And there's no reason to assume whatsoever that what you say and what you do are in alignment. Like they might be, but often with people they're not in alignment at all. So, and, and the postmodernists are a classic example of that. They wouldn't turn to Marxism otherwise. You know, because the postmodernists say, well, there's no grand narrative, there, everything. In some sense, everything is a matter of contextual interpretation. Um, and then that leaves them with nothing and nowhere to go. So they, the Marxism comes in as a substitute for that. And, or maybe even the postmodernism was just a rationalization for the Marxism to begin with. It's not obvious from the historical record. But they don't act out their claims because they can't. So, so this post-truth idea is... That's a demonic idea, really. I mean, you know, that's strange language to use, but there are some ideas that are so pathological that only archetypal descriptions are appropriate. Well, you know, it, it's always a question to some degree which of our partial realities is true and which of them is false. It, it is to some degree context dependent as well because the environment tends to move around, you know, like, so you might say that there was a set of relatively more radical left-wing ideas that were more appropriate in 1964 than they are now, say with regards to civil rights, and because the, the underlying situation has actually changed and so the representation should change. Um, is it is it false consciousness? Well, that's a very deep question, because it depends on what you mean by false. I mean, people are motivated by all sorts of... People have all sorts of motivations that they don't necessarily understand. And sometimes they put one s forward one set of motivations as a mask for another set of motivations. I mean, one of the things I've been trying to unpack, for example, is there's a Marxist claim that... Um, the Marxist theory is predicated on care for the, either the working class or the oppressed, depending on whether it's classical Marxism or sort of identity politics Marxism. And I read a, a book by George Orwell called Road to Wigan Pier, and where he questions that assumption. He said, as far as he was concerned, the English socialists that he met, and this was back in the 1930s and 40s, didn't so much like the poor as they hated the rich. Well. Maybe that isn't true of everyone who wants to speak for the working class, but it's certainly true of a substantial number of them. Um, often you use an ideological mask to, 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 to shield from yourself what your true motivations are. Say, well, you look at Marxism and you think, well, are, they actually, are the Marxists actually motivated by compassion and the desire to help the working class? Well, then you allow the Marxist ideas to unfold in society and you watch what happens. What happens is the working class gets slaughtered. And so does everyone else. And so then there's an indication that the stated motivations and the real motivations aren't the same. 
and, and that's a big problem. And, and you see, because we're polarizing in our society now, you see that sort of thing happening all the time. It's not easy to put your finger on what the, what the actuality of the situation is. I think ideologies are like that often, is that you, they, they, they place a mask of virtue over a dark set of, of motivations. And I, I really do think that that's the case with the, well, it tends to be the case with extremist ideologies, period. You know, I'm standing for the nation, and so, but no, I really have a tremendous amount of hatred and I'm going to take it out on anyone who's foreign. You know, that's sort of typical of the, of the Nazi type ultranationalists. And then on the left, it's like, well, I like the poor and the oppressed and I stand for them. It's like, well, no, you're just resentful and jealous and, and, and you don't believe that hard work matters because you don't work hard and you don't plan to. And, and so you can place a mask of virtue over your miserable, destructive resentment, and then you can tolerate looking at yourself in the mirror. And so, I mean, this is why I'm no fan of ideologies, generally speaking, because they have exactly that property. I don't know how we know, but I do know that we know. You know, like sometimes you say something and you're not sure whether it's true or not. You have li it's a complicated question because you have limits on, your knowledge is in fact limited. So you're limited by your ignorance. And so you can never necessarily say that what you're saying is true. Especially if you think of truth as a complete description of reality. It's like, well then ne never anything you say is true because it's, it's incomplete. But I don't think that that's in accordance with people's actual the actual experience of their reality. I think that you know perfectly well when you're lying, at least some of the time. And I think that manifests itself physiologically as much as any other way. You know, I've asked my, my classes, for example, many years in a row, uh, because I think it's an interesting phenomenon. It's like, how many of you have had the experience of a little voice in your head talking to you, essentially, when you're about to do something that you know to be wrong, and everyone puts up their hand. Now, it isn't a voice for everyone, sometimes it's a feeling, but people have that capacity, right? What we think about that as conscience, what, whatever that is. It's a, it's, a mor it's a form of moral orientation, partly as a consequence of socialization. I think it's biologically instantiated, because it, it seems so incredibly, well, people have been talking about it since the beginning of time. Um, we better have a sense of when we're in alliance with the truth or when we're spouting falsehoods because when you act out a falsehood then something terrible happens. That's the definition of a falsehood, fundamentally. So it's, it's based on a slightly different notion of what constitutes truth than one that's purely based on the idea of objective reality. It's, it's based more on pragmatic reality, you know. So if you accept a set of propositions and you're you, are, you receive a psychophysiological signal that that's unreliable. That's an indication that if you act it out in the world, you're going to walk over a cliff, and then you'll die, and that'll be the end of that. And so, to, to think that we have no instinct, so to speak, to, to help us identify when that's the case, is to say that thought is of no utility in relationship to survival. Well. I mean, you can say that if you want, but it's not a very, you have, it's not a very credible argument. We're hardwired to be tempted to lie to ourselves, and the lies are very interesting. You know, I've studied that for a very long time, trying to figure out exactly that. Now, so imagine that your belief systems are essentially maps of the world. So they're maps that you use to orient yourself with because we move from point to point, right? We're active creatures. And then those maps are very complexly structured. They're sort of hierarchically structured. And so, for example, you have some assumptions that are predicates of more of your actions than others. So, for example, here's a good, here's a good way of thinking about it. Imagine that you're teaching your child to set the table, and they put the fork and the knife on the reverse sides of the plate and you say, you're a stupid kid, 
you've always been a stupid kid and you're always going to be a stupid kid and there's nothing that you can do to change that well you might say well is the fact that the child made that small mistake an indication that he or she is that kind of stupid kid and the answer to that is well it's some evidence now, now a sensible person would say well look you, you got the knife and fork to the table and you put it near the plate so good for you but you made this local mistake this tiny local mistake you just flipped these and you got it exactly right now I think everybody who had any sense would realize that the second response is much more reasonable than the first now the first response is one that knocks out the child's whole axiomatic system right you say well you're stupid so you're bad you've always been that way so that covers your entire history you can't learn so you're destined for that in the future it's like you've 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 torn apart the orienting map that the child uses in the world and it's a very important illustration because if you have an argument with someone that you love one of the appropriate tactics is to make the argument about the least that it has to be about and to specify what you want as precisely as possible because then you don't take the person apart now there are times when we encounter pieces of information that threaten the integrity of our entire belief system so another example would be you have a relationship with someone, an intimate relationship and it's predicated on the idea of fidelity and so all of your memories of the relationship have that as an axiom for the representations the way that you construe the present has that as an axiom and the way that you construe the future has that as an axiom and then you find out that the person has betrayed you and perhaps multiple times well your world falls apart and the reason it falls apart is because that presupposition of fidelity is an axiom for every representation of that relationship you've made and maybe of every representation of yourself you've made and maybe of every representation of other people that you've made and so it's a it's a it's a crucial card in the in the in the in the card house right you pull it out and everything falls okay well when people encounter information that is like that they're likely to turn a blind eye to it well and that often happens in the case of betrayal because it's very rare it happens sometimes it's very rare that if someone in an intimate relationship betrays you that you can't go back over the past and think, you know, there was a hint two years ago, there was another hint 18 months ago, we weren't holding hands as often, you know, he or she was always distracted, I knew, but I didn't ask any questions, it's willful blindness. Now the ancient Egyptians, they represented the state as Osiris, and Osiris was willfully blind, that was one of the characteristics of the state, and it was because of that that his evil brother, Set, who was like a precursor to the idea of Satan, chopped him up and destroyed him. And so the lies that you're talking about are often sins of omission rather than sins of commission. It's like something threatens our axiomatic system at a very fundamental level. We get a physiological signal of threat. The physiological signal says, you should watch this and pay attention and unfold it and unpack it and we think no we're not going there and no wonder because like you want your whole house of cards to collapse and you fall into chaos it's a terrible thing so that's why we're motivated to lie to ourselves but it's not helpful it's and the more you do it the more likely a precipitous collapse is, is to occur because you're not updating your your world models and actually the neuropsychology of that's reasonably well understood a guy named Ramachandran for example has done some good work on that and Alcon and Goldberg as well, and um, but that's why you know pe it's very useful to know that our axiomatic systems orient us in the world and regulate our emotions, and so if you destabilize someone's fundamental destabilize someone's fundamental axioms, you you dysregulate their negative emotion. That's also why people fight so hard to protect their not only their belief systems but their social systems. So. Well, there's plenty of motivation to falsify, but it's, it's a bad idea. You live out the falsifications and, and uh, the world hits you. People are motivated to do the least amount of damage to their cognitive structures possible to, to correct prediction errors. 
and that it's for the reason that I just described, which is that, you know, that the deeper the axiom that you have to adjust, the more you lose of your of the map that orients you in the world, and then the more emotional dysregulation you experience, and that's no joke. Like, you know, because people think of emotions in some sense as just subjective feelings, but they're not just that. They're psychophysiological reactions, and when you're it's like if you're in, say you're in a rough part of the city and you, and you lose your map. It's like, well, you're going to be worried. And the reason you're worried is because something bad might happen to you. And so what your body does is ramp up into a state of emergency preparedness. And an emergency preparedness is a bunch of bad things might happen, and so I better be ready for any and all of them. And so it's very, very, very physiologically demanding. And you can handle that for short periods of time, but if you're in a state like that and it's chronic, well, that's stress, and that hurts you. You know, it, it, it hurts your brain, it, it destroys brain tissue, it, it suppresses immunological function, it enhances insulin production, it increases the probability that you'll be obese, that you'll develop cancer, that you'll develop heart disease, that you'll age. It's really no joke, and so when something axiomatically impossible happens, people are going to scramble to find reasons that don't require a retooling of their world view. And it's, it's no wonder, because they're, they're avoiding, in archetypal terms, they're avoiding an involuntary descent to the underworld, and even to hell. You know, like, for example, let's say that you're betrayed by your partner. You don't want to admit it. Well, no wonder, because all your memories of the past are wrong. Your view of your partner is incorrect, and so maybe your view of human beings and yourself is incorrect. And your future is like, well, hey, it isn't what you thought it was going to be, so God only knows what it is. But then, you know, when you dig into that, you might also find that there are reasons your partner was not faithful. Maybe you're a real son of a bitch, and you deserved everything you got. And so when you dig down and you have to restructure those axioms, not only do you have to encounter the unknown as such, which is <laughs> no joke, but you may also have to discover your own malevolence, well, it's no wonder people turn away from that. You know, like a, a, a worldview adjustment is a major revolution, and it's, it's and you may not recover from it, that's the other thing, you know, if you're broken, and you can be broken by betrayal, there's no reason to assume that you're going to pop out at the other end of that sadder but wiser. It just might do you in, it might kill you, may, or maybe you're chronically depressed, or, or maybe you're resentful and hostile and, and murderous, or there's no reason to assume that you will recover. So it's no wonder people are afraid to do that. It's, it's not surprising at all, and everyone is like that. So you struggle to find the least amount of repair you have to do to keep your pragmatic prediction system intact. Well, and often that means accusing someone else, because then they have to change and not you. And it means exaggerating one fact at the cost of another, as you scramble to maintain your ground. I would say, I don't know if it's the media so much in the US as, as it is the Democratic Party. You know, the Democratic Party made some big mistakes in that election. They basically lost the election. It isn't so much that Trump won, although there's some of that, and in my view, it's definitely they lost. And I think they lost for a variety of reasons. There was probably a number of things that tipped the scales, because there wasn't much tipping that had to be done. But the fact that they decided to play identity politics was a big part of it. Now, what that means, perhaps, is that if the Democrats want to get back on track, they have to re-examine the axioms that led them to accept identity politics as an as a appropriate mode of being in the world. That's a big retooling, man. It may not even be possible. It may be that new Democrats have to emerge to replace the old ones, because the old ones are done. They can't learn. It's too late. We'll see. You know, there's a difference between wishing that people would live by truth and wishing that they wouldn't lie. You know, if you watch yourself through the day, there are things you don't know about, and then maybe you talk about them anyways, and hopefully that isn't what's happening right now, but you know now and then that you're saying something or acting in some manner that isn't in accordance with what you know to be true. Well, you cannot do that. Living in truth, that's a different issue, because 
I mean, that requires, it may not be possible, it would require a superhuman effort to never utter a falsehood. But, and then maybe you can start seeing what the truth is, so to speak, but at least people cannot lie, not outright lie. And that's a good start. I mean, you see this, well, I've been, I've had some posters put up in my neighborhood recently, um, warning the community about me. So that's actually what they say, community warning, you know. And there's a, and I don't mind that people disagree with me. Um, it's their fate. They'll act out their presuppositions and they'll find out what the consequences are. So fine. But there's a lie in the poster, you see. And so the lie is, they, they put a picture of me up. And I look very aggressive. I'm, my mouth is open and I'm, I'm yelling. And I am actually yelling. But the reason I'm yelling is because I'm at a free speech rally that was shut down by radical leftists. And they took the mic and they shut down the PA system and they blasted white noise. And so the reason that I'm yelling and look aggressive is because I'm trying to make my voice heard over their noise. But that's the picture they picked to portray me. Well, they knew, or they were willfully blind, they knew that that was a trick. Now they feel the ends justify the means, I suppose. But they didn't have to do that. Like they could have put up posters about me without lying. I think the posters would have even been more effective because what's actually happened, I tweeted the posters for example, is that, because they tell people to write the university and tell them what a reprehensible human being I am, and as far as I know, they've had the reverse effect. Many people have written the university and told them how reprehensible the poster producers are and that, you know, that I'm not what they claim I am. Well, the lies didn't help them. They knew they were lying. They did it anyways. Well, when you do that, you, you, you corrupt the structure of the world and you corrupt your own soul and God help you. We're, we're talking about whether there is such a thing as truth. Okay, so let, let's say that the role of a journalist, and I think journalists played this role quite nicely before, I think things started to go south in the 80s, but I think the journalists in the 70s and 60s and 50s and so on were, many of them were trying to lay out an unbiased simplification of the situation and to let the viewers, readers, make up their own minds you know, to the degree that that was possible. Like if you look at an old Time magazine, it's a completely different thing. From the 70s, they're like 100 pages thick. It's all text. It's dense. It's denser than today's Economist by a large margin. And, you know, it's people grappling with ideas. Um, okay, so now that isn't how things work now in the, in the, let's say, in the mainstream media, to use a rather cliched phrase. Well, you know, maybe they say, well, it doesn't matter. There's no such thing as truth anyways. It's like, yeah, it matters. Nobody under 30 listens to you. Why? Why is that? Why are they going to people like, well, Rogan's a good example, with, who has no production values and no real editing, and it's just like a rough conversation between two people. Why are they listening to that? Well, there's your, there, there's your evidence. Now, you don't have to pay any attention to it, and I don't really think that the classical media giants are paying attention. I think they're too old, actually. Like, I was <laughs> looking, there was an MSNBC clip on YouTube about this robot uh, that, that has embedded AI and some emotional responses. So I was uh, kind of interested in that, so I went and watched it, and it was like a four-minute clip. It only had like 12,000 views, which I found peculiar. But they put a 30-second ad at the beginning of it, and you couldn't skip it. Like, they don't know the conventions. It's like, first of all, an hour of content might justify a 15 second ad, and you get to skip it. It's like, you're going to ask me to pay for your four minutes of professionally edited fluff with 30 seconds of my time? That's not going to work. So they're off, in an, they're off in another world, and it isn't working out, and, and they're collapsing and young people are turning in droves to these alternative media sources. And I think the reason for that is they're not getting an unbiased simplification from the media, which is what they should be getting. So, consequences. You know, falsehoods have consequences. That's what makes them false. 
And you can not believe that, it's fine. You can even get away with it for some period of time. But you're not going to get away with it for very long. People don't trust editing anymore. Not really, because they don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And so, and it, it's almost as if, if your content isn't significant enough to overcome your technical inadequacy, we don't want to watch it. And uh, that's so interesting, and I guess it's also because, you know, media savvy young people, if they've clipped together a video, they can do a pretty damn good job of, of hitting near CNN quality with their editing, you know, especially if they're smart. And so they're just not impressed by that. It's no longer a signal of competence, that. And in fact, it's become a signal of things going on behind the scenes that you don't understand. Commercial interests, ideological interests, corporate interests, whatever. But not your interests, that's for sure. Well, if it's news, it's, it's kind of like, the, that question is sort of like the question, what constitutes information? Well, if something's informative, well, it informs you, and what that means is it, it brings you into alignment better. There should be an alignment between you and the world. If you're properly informed, you're in a formation, right? And a formation is ordered and, and sequential. And you think, well, what does that mean? Well, if, if you and I might ask you for directions and you inform me about where I'm going and then I follow your directions and I get there. It's like, so I'm in alignment with the world all of a sudden because you've informed me. Well, if it's real news, it informs you. And what that means is it updates your map. You know, it, it, it takes something that's, it, it, you have a journey that you're on. And it isn't fully mapped out because what the hell do you know? And then someone tells you some news and you think, oh, I have to make a slight detour here. I have to change the way I'm looking at the landscape slightly. That's news. Now you might ask, well, is much of what is news actually information? And the answer I have to that is no, hardly any of it. I haven't watched television news for 30 years, I would say, because I think, well, if it's only relevant today, it's not relevant. I don't want to know what's only relevant today. Why the hell would I pay any attention to that? So, you know, I, I've subscribed to The Economist for quite a long time, although I haven't renewed it recently for a variety of reasons, but at least they're talking about things that are going to be relevant conceivably over a month or a couple of months period, and, and I believe they were reasonably unbiased, although I'm not so sure about that anymore. I, I think the quality of that magazine is actually dropped. Um, news updates your map and then you don't fall into a hole and get eaten by a crocodile. And in, that's what information is essentially too, is that it updates the manner in which you orient yourself in the world. So that's partly your perceptions and partly your actions. And, and you'll pay for that, right? Because it's cheaper to pay for it than it is to learn it through experience. So I guess that's what news is. News is something that it's cheaper to learn than it is to, to learn by paying for it than it is to learn through experience. And most of it's not news. I scan a lot of different sources. You know, I do look at newspapers a bit. Um, I, I read a lot online, but I spend most of my time reading books, not I read books, mostly, and that's where I get my news, you know, and you might say, well, that's not the cutting edge dynamic news, and it's not, and I follow Twitter, and, and I look online, and I glance at the major, I still glance at the major news front pages now and then, I like the BBC so far, um, but mostly I'm trying to concentrate on things that have a longer shelf life. Well, status is really important to people. I mean, although I would say uh, I've had to think through my terminology with regards to that for a long time. Now, I mean, people exist in hierarchies like most animals, right? Even very ancient animals live in hierarchies. It's, n it's not something human beings created. The patriarchy is not a human creation. It's way older than human beings. It's a third of a billion years old. So, and you have a counter in your brain that tells you where you are in the hierarchy. And 
the higher you are in the hierarchy, the more serotonin your brain produces and the more your negative emotions are regulated. So what that means is that for every unit of uncertainty you encounter, you produce fewer units of emergency preparedness. It's a big deal, you know, because if you're at the top of a, let's call it a hierarchy for now, you're pretty secure. You've got a lot of allies, right? You've got a lot of influence. You've got a lot of wealth. You've got a good place to live. And so if something creeps into your life that's not so good, you don't have to panic about it. You've got options, whereas if you're at the bottom of the hierarchy, you're barely clinging to the side of the window, you know, with your fingernails, something that moves one finger might send you plummeting to your death, so you're in a constant state of hyper-anxiety. People really care about where they are in the hierarchy, because that old counter, which is a third of a billion years old, tells them how upset to get about uncertainty as a consequence of their placement in the hierarchy. Now, the postmodernists would say, well, all those hierarchies are predicated on power, which is to say they're all tyrannies, and that's actually untrue, no, not in functional societies, and our society is functional. And you might say, well, how do you know that? And I would say, because the electricity is on. You know, I mean, this incredible infrastructure we have works almost all the time, almost for everyone. And so, that means the hierarchy isn't a hierarchy of power and tyranny, it's a hierarchy of competence. And so there's no reason to be cynical about that. Now you might say, well, it gets polluted with power and it gets polluted with tyranny. It's like, yeah, 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 it's not perfect. You know, and tyrants emerge and psychopaths emerge and, you know, and, and not everyone is equally well served by the system, of obviously. But compared to any other system that's ever been or anyone that exists currently, well, all you have to do is look around, and all these people complaining about the tyranny of the system communicate with their iPhones and their Androids and never think for a second that the only reason those things work is because we live in hierarchies of competence, not hierarchies of power. So, well, so status is important, but it's not based on, in a functioning society, it's not based on power. You know, even Franz de Waal, who's a primatologist, has showed quite clearly that even among chimpanzees, they're pretty damn brutal. Tyrannical chimpanzee hierarchies are unstable. So what happens is you get a big ugly chimp who, who's like all muscle and, and, and irritability. He climbs the dominance hierarchy because he pounds everyone flat. It's like, yeah, he has a bad day though. And then two of the people that, or two of the chimpanzees that he brutalized gang up and tear him to shreds. So what De Waal has found among the chimps is that the stable hierarchies are run by males, because chimps are pat patriarchal in their structure essentially, but the chimps that stay at the top and produce a stable hierarchy are ones that groom other chimps and have friends and engage in mu mutual reciprocity and pay positive attention to the females and also to the infants. So the tyrant chimp just doesn't last. It's even true for chimps. Well, so the idea that our, this is the big leftist idea, all the hierarchies are corrupt. They only serve those who are at the top. It's all power. It's like, no, it's, that's wrong. And the proof is the fact that the hierarchy functions. Well, the prestige of the classic media was predicated on their influence. And so, let's say that the New York Times is an, in, an influential and prestigious outlet. Okay, why? Well, here's an example. You write a book, it hits the New York Times bestseller list. Well, who cares? Well, the reason you care is because if you hit the list, your book sales exponentially increase. And so the prestige is related to the power of the, of the institution to change perception and behavior. Well, so it's, it's, it's the brand, you could say. So the brand is the marker of that prestige that's been stored up across time. Yeah, but the thing is that the, the, the older media forms are raping their brands, right? They have value because they were prestigious, because they did change people's opinions and behavior, but that's evaporating. And it's partly evaporating because, well, there are new media forms, and it's partly evaporating because people no longer really trust them to give them that unbiased simplification. 
And so, and are the, and the thing about the egalitarianism of YouTube is that it's got its pros and its cons. And then this is the same with the web in general, is that the signal to noise ratio, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise, and that's what happens under extraordinarily egalitarian circumstances, is there might be a lot of signal, but it's damn hard to find it, because you don't have qualified gatekeepers. Now that's changing, because even though YouTube is egalitarian, there's a vicious hierarchy that's already developed, like almost everyone on YouTube has no subscribers, right? You know, a thousand, a hundred, something like that. A tiny proportion has a hundred thousand. An even tinier fraction has half a million, and then above a million it's like vanishingly small. So the hierarchy emerges, and I would say it's a hierarchy of competence almost by definition. Let's say, we don't know what YouTube does, but whatever it does, the people who have four million subscribers are doing best. So it's a hierarchy of competence right away. Well, like everything to some degree is a social construct. Like, uh, the, 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 the problem with those sorts of phrases is that they're used as one phenomena causes for everything. That's how you can tell if you're talking to someone who's an ideologue. It's like, well, why is that happening? Well, it's the patriarchy. It's like, oh, I see, it's happening because of society. Well, yeah, of course. You know, you could even say that you die because of the inadequacy of the patriarchy. You know, if it just got its act together, it could figure out how to make you immortal. Well, fair enough. You know, that's true, although it's not true in any useful sense. It's like, is, is, is it a social construct? You've got to be way more specific than that before, your com before a comment like that has any utility whatsoever. You've got to delve into the details, you know, and you also have to define what you mean. To some degree, because we're social animals, there, there isn't anything that we do that social, that society has no influence on. So, but that doesn't mean that everything is a social construct. That's just, it's muddy, muddy thinking. I don't think it will. I think it's done. You know, Marshall McLuhan, and his famous, the me I don't remember what he said exactly, the medium is the message, there we go, that's it. What did he mean by that? New technological forms require new forms of perception and behavior. And I used the MSNBC example earlier to show that they don't know the idiom, right? They think, well, YouTube, <laughs> low production values, you know, cute cat videos, we, there's no idiom. It's like there is an idiom, there's conventions. They don't know them. They can't make the translation. They don't know how. And so, I don't think they're going to survive. I don't see any evidence that they are, because I don't see any evidence that people under 30 care anything about, or even know to some degree, about the old school media organizations. That's not where they live. Now, I don't know if where they live is any better. It's different, though, that's for sure. And it's not obvious. Like, I don't think very many horse and buggy makers turned into auto ma manufacturers. You know, I mean, I assume some did, but my guess is the vast majority of them couldn't make the adjustment because they thought of the car as a horseless carriage. Well, that's not what it was. We don't even know what it was, but it wasn't a horseless carriage, that's for sure. So, and YouTube isn't. TV by a different form. First of all, it's permanent. That's weird. And, and unbelievably powerful, because it also means that for the first time in human history, the spoken word, or the, or the received image, has as much permanence as a book. But it's way faster to market. Way more people attend to it. Like, you know, I can put up a YouTube video that I make in a day, and it'll have 150,000 views in a week. I can't do that with a book. That would take me three years, and probably it wouldn't happen. I probably wouldn't sell 150,000 copies. So, it's a whole new thing. And it's, God only knows how powerful it is. You know, we have no idea. It's a Gutenberg revolution for the spoken word. 
it's a different thing. That's right. It's a different landscape. The old the, the rules that work for television don't work for YouTube because YouTube isn't television. Now I, that doesn't mean I know what it is, but but it likes things rougher. That's you know you can observe it to some degree. It doesn't like editing very much. It wants to see the mistakes. It wants to see the warts. It trusts it then. It doesn't want everything airbrushed and edited out. Um, it doesn't care as much about attractiveness. You know, like it isn't like all the YouTube people who have become influential are the good-looking news anchors that you see on CNN. In fact, I think that's also something that people have come to distrust. So, but you just can't make the lateral move from a, an old media to a new media, especially if you have contempt for the new media, which is a big mistake. It means you don't know anything about it. So you're shunted off into irrelevancy before you realize it and so you know maybe the same thing will happen to YouTube too in five years because a new technology will come out that could easily happen so I would say no I don't think so, but I think that's, I think maybe that would be the case if they knew the context, you know, but I think, I think it's very easy and some, it's been something I've been absolutely horrified about for the entire last year, it's like, it's certainly possible that I've said something in the 260 videos that are online, most of my previous courses, that if taken out of context would sink me, right, that hasn't happened. Thank God for that, you know, it means I've either been very fortunate or I've been very careful about what I've been saying and I would say both of those are true. It's certainly possible that I'll say something tomorrow and be done. That's the most likely, I felt that way the whole year, the most likely outcome for me was that I would say something that would sink me and all the context in the world wouldn't matter, so I think it's I'm more protected than that now, I would say, because I've been attacked a lot and, you know, it's the crying wolf phenomena. If you attack, if you hear a hundred attacks on someone and they all turn out to not be true, you're probably less likely to believe the hundred and first, but like I have this talk coming up on November 11th, which I'm actually very worried about because I know that the protesters who will be there in force have been emboldened by the fact that they got the same talk cancelled by Ryerson University about three months ago. And I'm quite nervous about the possibility that someone who's hypothetically, um, what would you say, I hate to say, who's hy who hypothetically holds views that are similar to the panelists, even though the panelists are very diverse, will do something fatally stupid and it'll be captured or or even not so stupid and will be edited to look bad and you know that that'll that'll be a catastrophe or that there will be agents provocateur placed in the audience to do exactly that so the the price of a social media mistake is infinite maybe maybe it would be appropriate for us to think about the media access that individuals have now as an amplifier, you know, rather than something that's necessarily negative or necessarily positive. This has happened a lot to me in the, in the last year, where something that could have been negative wasn't, in fact, it turned out to be very positive. And I do think I'm in a position now so that I have more leeway for error, but, but I don't have, I still don't have a lot of faith in that, you know, because I can come out, I can make a video and saying, look, like, as far as I can tell, this is what happened, I take responsibility wherever that was necessary, and now I might, that might be okay, depend on the magnitude of the, of the error, right, so, but, so fair enough. Well, and, and the reason, and the reason I bring that up is, again, I don't like to argue, is just in terms of one of the things I like to think about is, like a hit piece doesn't win, right, public shaming doesn't really work like it used to, because the media doesn't control when your message gets out. So if the media y goes Yes, out, okay. So well, you certainly have more defense now. You know, so if that that's exactly right. So if if something is is published about me, um, 
I can make a video saying, well, n no, this is what I think, and, and that is powerful. And, and, but the, that works for people who have some influence in YouTube. Like, if you're a, someone whose channel has very few viewers and, and someone takes out a hit piece on you, then you can't defend yourself very well. But certainly, someone who's well positioned on YouTube, like, it's not obvious to me, this is a weird thing, like, it's not obvious to me that I have less influence than the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, for example, which is pretty damn weird, you know, and it's like, I say that with, it might not be true, that might not be true, but we don't know how to measure these things, so if I get attacked by a major news outlet, it isn't clear that they will have more readers than I will have viewers, so, so the, the easy access to YouTube does give you some defense, but that's also predicated on having a following of some significance, so that you have some impact when you speak. So, I guess it's a consequence of being a media force as an individual. But you can, that, you can certainly have that now. It, it's not easy, but it's certainly possible. And, and I'm thinking, of course, of uh, PewDiePie, or PewDiePie was his name, where the Wall Street Journal claimed it was a Nazi because he had made some humorous videos and done some satire. And all I saw when I watched that, and this is what, I don't know if you, you ever watched Scott Adams or Periscope, but they, the two movie centers. I think one people, one set of people watching the movie where they go, wow, the Wall Street Journal really hit PewDiePie hard and made him look like a Nazi. And I think a bunch of people, most people, especially people in their 30s, the movie they saw was, wow, the Wall Street Journal lied about this guy that we know is a good guy. So Wall Street Journal is garbage now. We'll never trust them again. Right, 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 right. Yeah, well, you can see that, that power shift occurring, definitely. And, I mean, I, I haven't seen any good studies of this. Like, I don't know, you know, if you took your typical 25-year-old, say, American 25-year-old, what proportion of their information they're garnering from, let's say, the, the YouTube heavy hitters, and what proportion they're garnering from classical sources. My suspicion is it's more the former than the latter, and certainly the case for a very large number of people, even though it might not be true for the average person yet. I don't know. And it's so new. Like, I would say YouTube's only become a significant cultural force, what, over the last three years? It's something like that. It's like, it's, it's completely new. So, we don't know what to make of it yet. Yeah, that's sort of kind of a peripheral point, but it's on point two, which is, I've gotten caught a lot of like media attention because I was able to bring people from the online world to the offline world, and just feel free to riff off of this point, but I had a big epiphany where I would watch a lot of fitness channels on YouTube, and then I would notice they would have fitness expos, and the lines would be out the door, and these people never got one piece of media coverage. The New York Times never, never talked about them, and then I realized, holy crap, all these people from YouTube, they are showing up to your stuff, they are, they are yeah. your books, they are going to your films what the hell is this? And then I kind of applied that to journalism or politics or whatever. Well, I was just on a Jocko Willink's podcast, and Jocko has published a book recently, and it, it's had no real media coverage, but it hit the New York Times bestseller list, and the only reason for that is because he's been talking about it in his podcast. He has a million listeners, you know, a day, uh, uh, per podcast. Like, that, that's a lot of listeners. I think he does one a week, something like that. So, yeah, you can, you, yeah, and I, I, got this book coming out in January called 12 Rules for Life, and it's doing very well in pre-sales, and the only reason for that is that I've tweeted about it a bit, not much, I haven't even made a video about it yet, although I talked to Dave Rubin about it yesterday, but we, we don't, and I, I'm, I'm trying to work that out with, it's Penguin Random House that's publishing it, and they have publicists, right, and we're trying to figure out, it's like, okay, how exactly do you market this? Like, and I don't even know, like, is their publicity team any stronger than my publicity team? It's, it's not obvious at all. And so, well, it's new territory. We're all feeling our way. We're at a point where, I, like, Judeo-Christian ethics can't die. Because if they do, or it does, then our civilization is done. Because 
its foundation blocks are of that ethic. Now then the question is, well, is there anything to that? Well, that's partly what I've been exploring in this biblical series, which has been oddly popular. Right? I think the most popular video I've ever made, the most viewed video, is the first one in the 13-part biblical series that I've done so far, called An Introduction to the Idea of God. And it's an investigation into the metaphysics of consciousness, I suppose. My proposition is that what is expressed in the story of Genesis, right at the beginning, is the idea that the essential creative element of divinity is expressed in the idea of the Logos, the Word, right? So and the idea there is that there's something about, well, what we're doing here, say, which is the exchange of communicative information that is constitutive of the world. It calls a world into being. And, and that consciousness plays a role of calling the world into being through language. And that's the image of God in, in man, as far as I can tell. Now, that may not be all it is, and I'm not claiming that I have an exhaustive account of that story, because it's not possible to have an exhaustive account of it. But there's a really deep idea in there, which is that the individual participates in the creation of being through his and her use of communication. And that as a consequence, then that's the reason that the individual is of transcendent value. And I think that's true. It's not metaphorically true. It's not symbolically true, although it might be both of those as well. It's just true. And if we lose that, then we're in trouble. And we can't lose it. Now, people act as if it's true. Because we treat each other, when we're treating each other properly, as if we're locales of the co-creation of being. That's why your opinion matters. That's why you have a right to it. That's why other people listen to you. It's important that that happens. Now, unfortunately, our explicit understanding that and our implicit understanding of that aren't in alignment. That's really the death of God, in some sense, in the Nietzschean sense. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to let's say, rectify. It's one of the things that Carl Jung was trying to rectify. You know, because Nietzsche knew that with the death of God, there would come both nihilism and totalitarianism. And he knew it would be of the radical leftist sort, most particularly. And he knew that it would result in millions of deaths. He predicted all of that, which is unbelievable. And, and Nietzsche thought, well, human beings would have to become supermen in some sense, in order to overcome the death of God, to bear it. And that they could do that, in some sense, by voluntarily recreating themselves. Now, Jung was a student of Nietzsche's. Not technically, but, you know, but intellectually. And he was very interested in that idea of the recreation of the Superman. But Jung knew something that I would say Nietzsche didn't know, which was that we don't get to create ourselves. We participate in the creation of being, but we're already formed creatures. We have a nature which we cannot override. Well, you know that. You can't just tell yourself what to do. You won't just trot out and obey yourself, which is really weird, you know? It's like, you think, well, I'm going to change my diet, I'm going to exercise more. It's like, no, you're not. You can't just, you just don't follow your own orders. And so Jung said, look, we have a deep, deep nature. And it's expressed in symbolic vision and that in, in archetypal reality, essentially. And we have to communicate with that in order to restructure our value systems. And I believe that he was correct. And so that means going back into the past. And well, they, this has almost become an internet meme. Rescuing your father from the belly of the whale. Rescuing your dead father from the belly of the whale. Right? And that's that's what needs to be done. And that means to revivify particularly the idea of the Logos, the idea of the divinity of the communicative capacity of the individual, which is the fundamental predicate of our society, right? Our society says that the individual is sovereign over the community. The community is important. The individual has responsibilities to the community, but the community has to hold the individual as the sovereign entity. 
It's like, yes, that's right. And it's taken people, it's not an arbitrary ideological statement, it's taken people hundreds of thousands of years to develop that idea to the point where it can be reasonably articulated. You know, it was expressed in ritual, it was expressed in myth, in image, all of that. We were acting out this dream that represented that. that that's, what, that's what the, that the, the Christian drama is about, in essence. It's about what the entire Bible is about, in some sense. But it's not like we understand that in an articulated manner. Now, I think Jung went farther than anyone to, to make that articulated understanding a possibility. And that's the sort of thing that I'm trying to further. And that seems to be working. I mean, one of the things that I've noticed is that, and this is a remarkable thing, is that talking to young men in particular about responsibility and truth is a highly marketable message. They're, they're half dead for lack of that message. And that's, who would have guessed that? You know, it's, it's, so I have this theatre in Toronto where I give these lectures and they're sold out every time, which is you know, if you would have gone to someone with a business plan and said, well, I'm going to rent this theatre, and I'm going to give lectures on the psychological significance of the biblical stories, uh, what do you think? You want to lend me some money uh, on that bet? They would have laughed you right out of the office. It's completely unlikely. But these old ideas, man, they're, they're eternal. That's what they are. And you become dissociated from them at your extreme peril, psychologically and socially. Arrogant people, resentful people, believe that deception works. And it, that's just not the case. You can't bend the structure of reality without it snapping back at you. It might not snap back when you expect it to. But it'll knock you off your feet at some point. You might not even notice the causal connection. But the causal connection is there because the world is a causal place. And, and things just don't go away. You know, if you, if you introduce an act of deception into the world, it stays and it, it manifests itself until someone fixes it. You know, the postmodern idea one of them is that there's an infinite number of ways to interpret the world. And that actually happens to be true. So you have to give the devil his due. The world's a very complicated place. And there's an, a very large number of ways of interpreting even a very small set of objects. So, but that's not, but then, okay, so fine. So that's a problem. Then the question arises, well, how do you know if your interpretation is canonical or true or valid or valuable? Well, how can you tell? Maybe you can't, that's the postmodernist claim. And then Im immediately everything devolves into something approximating a power game. It's all very sketchy in terms of its logic. But the initial presupposition is correct. But the second presupposition is wrong, because actually the range of interpretations that you can successfully apply is unbelievably tightly bounded. And it's bounded well, it's bounded in the case that we talked about earlier with regards to the chimps. There are levels of brutality that the chimp troop will not tolerate. So, so here's, here's how the constraints work. I mean, first of all, there are the constraints of the world beyond the social. Let's call that the natural world, for lack of a better term. And if the interpretation of the world that you're using doesn't allow you to meet your basic biological requirements, then you die. Now you might say that, well, just because you die doesn't mean that you were wrong. It's like, okay, you can have a discussion about that. But it certainly does mean that you're dead. So and if you're not dead and, and you don't have the right, a useful, proper interpretation of the world, then you're in extreme agony and you're probably want, going to want to avoid that because that's sort of the definition of agony. It's that which you want to avoid. And so there's a lot of interpretations of the world that you can have that will produce agony. You can walk into a biker bar and go, like, harass the biggest, ugliest guy in there, and then you'll get pounded half to death. 
and that'll be an indication that unless you were aiming at being pounded to death, that wasn't a good selection from among the infinite number of interpretations applicable in that bar. Okay, so those are pretty basic, right? But then there's more complex ones, like we shouldn't have an interpretation that works today, but that puts you in a worse place tomorrow. That's, that's a tough constraint, right? That's a really tough one, but then it's even worse. You shouldn't have an interpretation that works today, but puts you in a bad place next week, or next month, or next year, or maybe even ten years from now. So there's a sequence of temporal extensions across which your action in the present has to function. It's like, good luck figuring that out. That's hard. That's really hard. You act now so that you benefit in the future. But that's not the end of the constraints. You have to act now so that other people will either cooperate or compete with you in the present in a sustainable manner across all those time frames. So, infinite number of interpretations, yes. Finite number of practically applicable interpretations, like really bounded, tightly bounded. That's actually why in some sense there are archetypes. Because there's a very small universe of functional interpretations. And, th and th those are they're ancient and stable. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be able to perceive the world. So, so the whole postmodernist idea is correct with regards to the infinite number of interpretations and just wrong beyond belief about the rest of what unfolds as a consequence of that initial presupposition. And those time so. frames can extend into eternity. That's the thing. Well, and you know, the, 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 the fundamental religious claim is that your proper time frame should extend into eternity. Right? And that's, that's sort of the idea behind acting so that you enter paradise for eternity. That's, speaking psychologically, that's the idea. You should aim at the eternal good, that's, and that should be the constraint system within which you perceive and act moment to moment. Yeah, and again, I don't, that's not a metaphor, it's not a symbol, it's none of those things. It's actually, as far as I can tell, it's just true. So, and how could it be otherwise? How could it be otherwise that, then, that what you should aim for is the highest good that you could conceive of? How could it, it's, it's by definition that's what you should aim for. The highest good is that which you should aim for. So, and you have to aim. You can't even see without aiming. So you have to have an aim, and it should be the highest aim. What is it going to be? You should aim for the lowest. Well, no. It, it, it contradicts the very idea of aim. So. Well, so that's part of the postmodernist critique. And well, then and you asked about its, its relationship with Christianity. Well, so there's an aim in Christianity, um, apart from its individuality and its emphasis on the logos, the truth, right, and the highest aim. There's actually an elaboration of part of what that highest aim is. And, and it's rough, man, it's a rough one. And it's sort of embedded in the idea of Christ's passion. And so, Two things happen that are archetypal in the Passion story. One is that Christ takes responsibility for the evil of the world onto himself. That's a psychological statement. It's like, you're human, right? Human beings have the capacity for malevolence. So the malevolence in the world is your problem. It's partly there because you're not good enough. You haven't put yourself together enough. And you're capable of those things. And you can say, no, I'm not. It's like, yes, you are. You just don't know. And it's no wonder you don't know. And it's no wonder you don't want to know. But it doesn't matter. And so Jung said, the shadow reaches all the way down to hell. And what he meant by that, it's no joke. And this is why people don't read Jung. It's like, it's not fun. He says, you look into your heart when you're deceiving and arrogant and resentful. And you go all the way to the bottom of what's there. And you're going to find something that once you see it, you'll never be the same. Well, so people don't go there. When Jung said, well, that's a precondition for any form of enlightenment. That's why Christ has to harrow hell before he can ascend into paradise. You know, that's a, that's a terrible idea. Okay, so that's the malevolence end of it. But then the other element of the passion is, well, it's to voluntarily accept the, your, your, your torturous destiny. Voluntarily, that's what acceptance of the cross means. Symbolically, the cross is an X. 
you're at the center of that X that's the center of suffering okay what are you going to do about that you're either going to embrace it or you're going to run from it well are you going to embrace it I mean that's a hell of a thing to embrace well what happens if you run from it it gets worse so there's a call there there's a call to accept and 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 attend to the malevolence to constrain it and a call to courageous being in the face of ultimate tragedy and that's part of the highest aim it's like that's not symbolic it's just true and so we can't lose that because the alternative like you think well what's worse is there anything worse than voluntarily accepting your own crucifixion so to speak yeah running from it so you got your poison on the one hand and you got your poison on the other hand you get to pick which one but there's no there's no there's no pain-free way out so you're either going to act nobly in the face of that and try to make things better or you're going to act in a cowardly deceitful and resentment resentful fashion and make everything worse those are your choices and you're making that choice with every choice that's the axis of choice so and it's no wonder people don't want to believe that God that's a horrible thing to believe you know we think people have meaningless lives because they've abandoned God and they're nihilistic and isn't that a catastrophe for them it's like yeah it's a catastrophe but it's not clear to me that it's more difficult than the alternative which is to think oh you're actually responsible for your decisions and their decisions between good and evil and your decisions tilt the world towards heaven or hell in a very real way directly it's on you it's like who wants to believe that that's meaning that's meaning you want meaning that's meaning it's like no man I'll take the nihilism and the despair it's easier well because it was an in, it was an an in, what would you call it? it was an intrusion on the logos that's one way of thinking about it I'm not going to say other people's words period and there well I just explained why to some degree the words you choose determine the structure of the world that you bring into being I'm not going to have my words put in my mouth by anyone other than me and so I don't care what the rationale is I don't care if the rationale is compassion I don't care what the rationale is it's not happening I have responsibility for my words I take that responsibility very very seriously and I, I just told you why because I believe that this logos idea is correct and so if someone wants to say something that's fine if someone wants to believe something that's fine but when that belief impinges on my right to determine my words then that's not all right you know for a while it was sort of about the trans community which isn't a community by the way it has just as much diversity as any other group of people and I've got plenty of letters from trans people supporting me about 40 and none criticizing me so far and they're not very happy about being made the poster boy for the latest ideological moves of the radical left so the idea that it's compassion or that it's some sort of community consensus is absolute nonsense but in any case it wasn't about that that was a peripheral issue but a line had to be drawn somewhere it's like compelled speech is wrong so I'm not doing it and when I made my video which I made like at 3 in the morning one night because I was upset about a variety of things including this legislation I think the reason that it went viral there was a bunch of reasons but one was I actually said that there was something I wouldn't do like it was really concrete it brought a, a vague ideological issue to a very precise point right and so that's how you make things real you make them into a very precise point it's like so when I said that's not happening and I meant it and I think people could tell that I meant it 
and I had my reasons for meaning it, which people more or less figured out when they started watching my other videos. And that also protected me, right? I had all these other, virtually every word I said to students in the last 20 years has been recorded and is available unedited for public consumption. And so that lent me some credibility. You know, people realized that I wasn't just flying off the handle, that I had read the legislation properly, that I was serious about my opposition to compelled speech, and that I had very well thought out reasons for being opposed to it. Like, I think I've thought it, well, I would never say that, I've, that anyone, I think it's a mistake for anyone to claim that they've thought something through all the way to the bottom. But I've thought it through as deeply as I can. And I've been thinking about it for thousands of hours for 30 years. So, like, if I've made a mistake, oh man, I'd love to find it. But, but, but I can't find it. So, and then people watch the videos and like the question is what's going on? What's going on with Bill C-16? What's going on with this trans issue? Nobody knows, we're moving up and down the levels of analysis. Is it political? Is it ideological? Is it philosophical? Is it theological? What the hell's going on here? Well, the people who opposed me said, well it's all political and so are you. And I said, no, it's not political at all. It's philosophical. It's probably even theological, but it's at least philosophical. Well, so was that true or not? Well, yes, it was true, because otherwise it, what should have happened is I made the video, there was a brief flurry of interest, it died out in 15 minutes, it was over. That's not what happened. So that means that there was more going on than, than what was on the surface. Well, it's, there was a variety of things. I mean, in the, the legislation itself looked rather harmless. In, it's not very long. It purports to add gender identity and gender expression to the list of protected groups under the Canadian Human Rights Code, essentially. And there's a bunch of problems with that. One being, gender expression is not a group. So, and that actually bothers me because, like, this is fundamental legislation and you, you got to get your damn terminology right, because otherwise you haven't thought it through. So, but that piece of legislation was surrounded by a cloud of policies, many of which were elaborated on uh, the Ontario, the website for the Ontario Human Rights Commission. And the federal government stated that explicitly, although they took that link down, which was not acceptable. It was falsification of the of the legislative intent, and, and the, the media didn't make much of that. They, some people reported it, but it was a very bad thing. Anyways, in the legislation there were a number of things that I objected to, one of them being the instantiation of a social constructionist view of gender into the law. The social constructionist view of gender is incorrect. Now, social, as we already discussed, social Viewpoints, society, has an impact on everything. It has an effect on gender. But so does biology. And that's, there aren't credible scientists who don't believe that. None. There are wingnut theorists in activist disciplines who push that and have now got it into the law because they know perfectly well they've lost the battle intellectually. And I think it's terrible that we've instantiated a social constructionist view of human identity into the law. Now that's a sophisticated topic, you know, and people don't get it, but I get it, and I know why they're doing it. So that was one. Then there was the compelled speech issue, which is, it's a requirement that I use your preferred pronoun. Well, which one? Well, whichever one you prefer. Well, there's 70 of them, and no one knows how to use them, and no one's picked them up in common parlance, and there's no agreement on what they should be. And why not your preferred adjective, then? And why not your preferred verb? And like, where does the limit of your control over my language end? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's like, if I knew you, and you wanted me to call you something, and we came to an agreement, I'd probably do it if I thought you were reasonable, that it was good for you, and that you were honest. But as soon as you tell me that I have to participate in your construction of reality under pain of law, it's like, no, I don't have to, and I won't. And so that was the issue. Well, I would say 
it's the same as the university's reaction in some sense. Look, if you're a Canadian and you come out and say, look, Canadians, there's something wrong with what's going on in your system, the right response from a Canadian is, no, there's something wrong with you. Because Canada is very stable and our government has been extraordinarily reliable and like it's a good country and you can ignore the politics, you know, we kind of move from a little bit left to the centre to a little bit right, that's the whole political game in Canada. You know, so if anybody comes out and says, wake up, something's wrong, you should not believe them and then you should figure out, well, is there something wrong with this person and so that was the initial response, it's like, there's probably something wrong with this person, you know, he's making a fuss and maybe he's mean and uh, he won't, you know, be nice to the, to the poor oppressed people. Um, but then they did their homework and found out that I'd actually read the legislation and that I knew what I was talking about. So, and then the press turned very rapidly in my favour and have stayed that way ever since, the mainstream press. So the major journalists in Canada, the print journalists, have virtually without exception been on my side. 200 newspapers, there's a conglomerate of 200 newspapers, came out expressly stating that they supported what I was doing. And even the university, which was all thrown up in the air by this to begin with, and sent me two warning letters telling me to, that I was probably violating the law by making the video complaining about the legislation, which is exactly what I had said in the video, that just making the video was probably violating the law. And so the university, their legal experts actually agreed with that. They told me twice to stop. Then we had a debate. I said I wasn't going to. They left me the hell alone and they gave me a sabbatical this year and they've taken steps to strengthen their commitment to free speech so I would say that the university, you know, people make mistakes and they didn't know what to do and it was a weird situation but I would say they did as well as could be expected under the circumstances and maybe better than that so, and the public support has been absolutely overwhelming you know, within Canada and then also now internationally. It's absolutely beyond comprehension. Well, it's tricky, right, because you are making decisions about what to include and what not to include when you're, well, when you're making this film, for example, and so you're your narrative is going to intrude on the film. So then I guess the question is, well, what should your narrative be? Your narrative should be something like, I'm constantly trying to go beyond the truth that I already hold. Because the truth that you already hold is not enough. Your, your life isn't what it could be, and everyone knows that. So you need to know more than you know. And so the narrative should be, when you're constructing a film, it's like, okay, I'm trying to clarify things more. I'm trying to extend what I understand more, not, here's the ideological truth about the structure of reality, and here's how I edit this set of interviews to conform precisely to that. That's, it's dead and sterile, it's propaganda, that's what propaganda is. And, and that's a propagandistic conversation can even be that, and you know when you're listening to one, because they're boring as hell. You know, if you listen to a conversation and there is genuine striving for the truth, it's a compelling conversation. This is partly why I don't script my lectures. Because what I'm doing when I'm lecturing isn't telling you what I know to be true. What I'm doing when I'm lecturing is trying to figure out things better. And so, I'm thinking. I don't know what, what the consequence of the thinking is going to be. But I hope that it'll be more clarification of the proper path through life. And the reason that I'm committed to that is because I know what happens when you deviate from the path. It's not good. It's seriously not good. It's, it's like world-shaking not good. And we know this if you read who I would regard as the most profound analysts of the totalitarian societies of the 20th century. They come to the same conclusion, which is that the totalitarian states would not have been possible without the moral corruption of the individuals within that society. 
So it was the degree to which the individuals within that society were willing to falsify their own experience that produced the totalitarian state. And if you think that through, then it should make you quake in your boots, because it means that to the degree that you falsify your own reality to yourself, say, you're contributing to the pathologization of the state. And the state is no joke, and it's, you think it's powerful now, you wait ten years. So we better get our acts together, because there's things coming down the pipes that we want to get right or else. So artificial intelligence would be one of those things. And we're seeing all that already in places like Google. They're using AI to, to, um, to what would you call it, censor. Well, <laughs> you better have your act together before you design AI systems that regulate people's communication because they're going to get unbelievably powerful and really, really fast. There are many things that everyone does that, they, that each person knows to not be true. Like, they're micro decisions usually. You know, they may say, well, the macro narrative is accurate. The thing about, you know, there are some circumstances under which a predominantly liberal narrative is accurate. Liberals are high in openness, they're quite creative. They're not very conscientious, so that's a problem but they tend to be creative and entrepreneurial. That's extremely useful. But conservatives, they're lower in openness, generally speaking, they're more tradition-bound, and they're very good at implementing. And so both those narratives, so to speak, if you think about them as embodiments or articulations of character, have their place in the world. It's the dialogue between them that keeps the balance right. So to the degree that what's being shut down is dialogue, genuine dialogue, then that's a big problem. Liberal or conservative doesn't make any difference. So. Mm, it's a good way of, of thinking about it. I mean, I, su I suppose what that means in some sense is that I'm correct in proportion to the degree of my suffering, something like that. And then the problem with that is you have a competition of suffering under those circumstances. And that's, that's actually the origin of intersectionality. You know, the oppression narrative was lacking differentiation. And so that's why intersectionality arose, and that differentiated it, but it has to be infinitely differentiated all the way down to the level of the individual. You know, it's, it's a logical flaw in the issue to begin with because it's actually the individual that's the locus of suffering. But it isn't because you're suffering that I believe you. It might be that I have some compassion for you because you're suffering. It might depend on why you're suffering. Sometimes I might think, well, that serves you exactly right. And then, unless you're willing to repent, let's say, then your suffering is just fine, because you haven't learned your lesson yet. So, just because you're suffering doesn't mean that you're right. Then you might say, well, what if you've chosen to voluntarily bear your suffering? Well, then, you know, you have a higher claim to, to, to the truth, I would say. You're acting out your claim to the truth. And, and people know that, because when you look out in the world and you see people you admire, even if they're not necessarily people who share your ideological presuppositions, but you sort of spontaneously admire them, you see very rapidly, if you investigate why, that it's courage that you respect, courage in the face of uncertainty, and maybe the willingness to fight malevolence. So, it's a, it's a natural orientation, and it has very little to do with suffering, it has to do with the willingness to bear it, and move forward regardless. So, yeah, it's a bad idea to replace logos with pathos, for, for any number of reasons. We're not agents of the truth because we suffer. That's not how it works. We're just suffering. 